All right, so we're here at Module 5, Online Investigations. And so let's start with that. Uh, the lecture is in here somewhere, like there. All right. All right, so they talk about undercover stuff, which I only know about by watching TV cop shows. Um, but there, this is how people sneak in. Now, um, background checks are really important when you hire people. Your HR department should be doing it. Most people don't. This is why I think 75% of resumes now contain lies. And you know there are extreme cases like George Santos that claimed to go to college he never even went to and have a job he never even had. But a lot of people exaggerate. And um, it is considered important to verify the information on the resume. They would catch an awful lot of criminals that way. Um, and then you can do surveillance where you're following people around in sting operations where you try to trick them into doing a bad thing so you can catch them. Uh, but these are pretty much just what cops should do. I don't think most security people or French people would get involved in that sort of thing. But if you want to create a sock puppet, and this is something people really do. Um, a, the red teamer on the Paul Security podcast, they asked him, do you have like fake identities you use? And he said, you mean today? Because he has dozens of them. And I know um, uh, Brian Krebs does this all the time. Brian Krebs infiltrates Russian crime syndicates online. And he taught himself Russian to speak like a native, and he has all these fake accounts, and he sneaks in. So he's inside the crime forums finding out what they're doing. And this is quite common to be done online, more than face-to-face. -face. So there's a lot of ways to do it. You can, there are fake name generators. There are tools to create a, a artificial picture of a person that it looks very realistic, but it's not a real person. Um, there's a lot of email accounts, free email and privacy email and temporary email accounts out there you can use. There's um, ways to send texts from a computer site or a burner phone so that they can't track it back to you. Um, yes, I know, that's Brian Krebs, it's surprising. He has been swatted, but he hasn't been uh, you know, shot or anything yet, which is surprising. He's messing with really dangerous people. Um, anyway, then of course, there's tons of ways to move money around and make it difficult to track with uh, cryptocurrency and PayPal and such. Um, it's increasingly difficult to do this because the US government has know your customer rules and they are trying very hard to make it very difficult to provide any kind of financial services to anybody without proving you know who they are so you can report the tax consequences and such. Um, but uh, anyway, people do it, although I think they largely do it by using services outside the United States. And then there's VPNs all over the place. Um, now, a VPN, I'm really not sure what good a VPN would do you in this situation. What you really need is a proxy, like Tor. Tor is not a VPN. It does not encrypt your traffic. You would have to add a VPN to it to encrypt your traffic. What it does is it bounces your traffic around so you can't tell where it came from, so people can't physically tell where you are, which is super important. If you're messing with criminals online, you don't want them to be able to physically locate you to take revenge on you. So that's useful, but that's a proxy service, and this is what people often use to appear to come from a different location to get around, say, geo-blocking of a sports event and such. But the cryptocurrency, you can track the transaction. That's right. You can track cryptocurrencies to some extent. Um, if you use Bitcoin or Ethereum, if you use more private uh, things like Zcash, and Monero, then not so much. But yes, to some extent you can track them, but it's much harder. And so the question, and also the criminals probably aren't going to be able to use those tracking services too well. So. But, but, but the US and the EU, they, they, they kind of have a um, uh, rule that no um, anonymous transactions. So they, everything is, all the transactions are. The US what? And the EU, yeah, no anonymous transactions. Well, they have an outlawed cryptocurrency. You can totally buy things with cryptocurrency, and that's pretty anonymous. Well, they can be. For example, if you use Bitcoin, you can make a separate account number for each transaction, and that makes it harder, although chain analysis can undo that. But if you use Zcash, every transaction is 100% anonymous, and it can't be prevented. And none of that has been blocked, so it's legal if you can find someone that will take it. But it just has never become popular enough. That's why the only thing people seem to use is Bitcoin. Even ransomware people still ask for Bitcoin, even though it's not anonymous. Which Oh, you buy it at overseas exchanges that don't don't care. That's you. That's what you do. But yeah, you wouldn't if you buy it from an American exchange. Then there's going to be a record kept. Absolutely. Anyway, um, so then you can mask your identity in making telephone calls. I mentioned before in other classes, you can spoof the uh, caller ID in calls, so you don't appear to be uh, who you are. There's much of online services to do that. 
And of course, here's more proxies to anonymize your physical location. So anyway, uh, law enforcement can track people through some of this by switching phone characters and so on. They can, their practice, just like they can de-anonymize cryptocurrency to some extent, they can de-anonymize attempts to hide who you are on the telephone network to some extent. Um, now, this is easier in a way for phone calls because of LEAP. LEAP is the law that requires all telephone networks to make it possible for police to tap the calls with a court order. There is no such thing for the internet. They keep trying to get it for the internet. That's right, email and uh, online chat are not, there's no way, most of those people do not provide any way for law enforcement to tap any of that, although they really want to. But phone companies must do that in America because of a law. Yes, they can get metadata, but you can make a service like a, like almost um, VPNs promise that they don't log anything, so they don't have any data. Now, it turned out a bunch of them are lying. They do, in fact, have the data, and they give it to law enforcement, and they sell it to people after lying to you. That's quite common in the VPN space, but some of them are run by privacy advocates, and they don't do that. The problem is, if you don't do that, how do you make any money? <laughs> but anyway, um, so then there's the dark web. Now, the, what you see if you just do a Google search is only a small portion of the web, like 5%, and those are the public pages that everybody can just see. Most of the web is hidden, not necessarily because it's criminal or anything, it's just hidden where you require something like a login to get there because it's like your email, which is not public. You can't just Google search and see somebody else's email. But there's also the stuff that's really nasty, um, the dark web, uh, the, the, which is um, hidden behind Tor, and it's almost all highly illegal and, and disturbing content like child pornography, malware, uh, criminal transactions, and things like that. Well, yes, some of them are. Yes, some of them are honeypots, and some of them, as we'll talk about, are, are ones that have been taken over by the government to run to catch the people using it. So anyway, there's an uh, open source intelligence framework to try to guide you through tracking things down, um, like Reddit and Tor and all these other sites that can give you information to find out about people and such. So there are charts to try to guide you through these uh, services to track people down. Tor is the main one you hear about. Tor is the civilian imitation of a military network originally designed for the Navy, which is still used by American spies and designed for American spies, but they figured out that if they used it for spies and nobody else was using it, the, using this strange protocol would be an obvious mark. So they said, we'll make it public so all the idiots in the world will download pornography on it, and that'll make a cover for the spy transactions to be hidden behind. And that's what it is. And um, so anyway, it's, um, it bounces all your traffic through three or more computers. The problem is all the servers are donated by various people, and uh, the less people are donating, it's getting harder for them to maintain it. And it's generally relatively slow, but it does hide your physical location. It does not, however, encrypt your traffic, something people often um, mistake it for. What it does is it hides the physical location of your traffic, and it does encrypt it intermediately. So the people in the middle running the servers do not know what kind of traffic they're transmitting, which is really important because 99% or more of the traffic on Tor is incredibly objectionable criminal stuff, like child pornography and malware. And that's why if you do donate service to Tor, which I did briefly and MIT did for years, most people quit after a while after you realize, you know, I don't really think we're improving the world. This is doing more harm than good. But anyway, it's the main anonymous site, and uh, you'll find dot .onion lo locations of addresses down there. Just a very long random number, dot .onion. So nobody can search them. There's no directory. There's no Google. You can put a site on Tor, and nobody will ever find it until you give them the URL, and you can run something highly illegal. And nobody can even tell what country you're in, so they can't find you to arrest you. Although, to be fair, they can't detect you by doing a network protocol of the... Um, data going into Tor, but they can still find you by, for example, finding a vulnerability in your website and hacking into it and putting malware on the web server, which phones home. And that's what the FBI did, and Anonymous did, and a lot of people did. And if you're taking the uh, web app security class, you'll be practicing 100 ways to do that. That's the problem. A customer that can reach your server and log in and such can hunt for a vulnerability on the server and take it over. And Tor does not prevent that, of course, because the traffic gets delivered there and it's not an exploit that relies upon knowing how the traffic got there. It just relies on having the traffic be misunderstood by the server when it gets there. Um, yeah, you could use a VPN with Tor to encrypt traffic. Yes, that would probably be a good idea. There's an, another one like Tor called the Invisible Internet Project. I've never used it. Another one called Freenet, which is an attempt to have uh, free storage everywhere. Um, sounds a little bit like the more modern version. is called the Interplanetary File System. But anyway, another one called Secure Drop, which is uh, something that came out after Edward Snowden 
or no, uh, Bradley Manning. Bradley Manning had to sneak documents to a researcher and got in trouble for it, and uh, to a journalist. And so many, um, the EFF, I think, yeah, the Freedom of Press Foundation set up this thing where you can put up secrets and we won't get caught supposedly, so did the Washington Post and many other places have a special so-called so secure drop system because WikiLeaks in particular had terrible security and they had anonymous people donate stuff and then they didn't handle it right and expose their identity. So a lot of other newspapers and such have offered a service claiming that they're more careful and that if you give them secret stuff, they won't expose your identity by poorly setting up the system. It didn't appear that a huge lot of that worked out. They were hoping after um, Manning and Snowden that there might be a whole bunch of few, few further whistleblowers leaking secrets to the press. All the press announced these services and I never heard of major scoops coming in that way. So it doesn't seem to have become a trend. Probably because both those guys went to jail or had to flee the country. Anyway, then there's dark web marketplaces. Um, this, uh, like Silk Road was the original one that would sell drugs and guns and murder for hire and other illegal products here. and, gun and um, it ran for quite a while behind Tor, and eventually the FBI got it, took it down, arrested the leader, and um, so it was down for a while. Then uh, Silk Road 2 came up, but it was run by Ross Ulrich right here, about 10 blocks from this college at the library. He was running it. They tracked him to the library and arrested him. Thank God he wasn't one of my students. I was worried he might be, but he was from MIT. Anyway, uh, and they, they caught him. They, I know they caught him because he didn't always use his VPN. Sometimes his VPN would fail, and he'd connect without a VPN, and he'd keep working anyway, so when you lock in the logs, there were some tracks leading right to where he really was, which is just ridiculous failure of operational security. That's how most of them get caught. They're just sloppy. I remember um, in the days of Anonymous and LulzSec, one of the main leaders of either LulzSec or AntiSec, a big hacking gang, claimed he had encrypted everything, but he just had a hard drive with all their unencrypted chats planning all their attacks that they just found when the cops raided him. They had the complete logs of everything just sitting there. Most of these people pretend to be secure, but they don't really have the discipline to actually bother to really encrypt everything and really not mix their private life and their evil life together. You know, So it's very easy to catch them. Then Playpen was a child pornography site um, full of pedophiles uh, putting up homemade content to get access to more. So the people are really disturbing here, and so they got a lot of people prosecuted here, dozens of child abusers. Uh, the FBI got in by hacking into the site and implanting malware on, and telling, putting a message on the site saying, we've upgraded security, you have to get this new version of Firefox to use it, and that was a poison version, so when you downloaded it, it would then send packets to the FBI so they knew who you were. But uh, it turned out they were very reluctant to have that technique exposed publicly, so they chose not to prosecute a lot of people to hide their methods, which is a fundamental problem. Another thing, which they don't mention here, but I, mean, I was around at this time, um, Anonymous hacked into that site and did the same thing about a month before the law enforcement people did, and they published what they said was a list of people who were pedophiles, and they added extra people to the list they didn't like. And that's the kind of thing, it seems to me, that really burns this thing in court. Um, anyway, uh, that was in the 2011, 2012, there were a whole bunch of anonymous hackers online that thought they were um, saving the world by trying to do law enforcement's job for it and doing it kind of badly and just making a mess. Sort of like, you know, teenage superheroes in the movies running around with costume, supposedly solving crime and in fact just sort of getting hurt and making things worse. Anyway, um, Operation Bayonet was another one, shutting down a bunch of notorious websites in Europe, seizing them. Um, all right. And then, of course, there's virtual currency. Now, there used to be on the gold standard, where you actually had coins made of gold or silver or something, and that was intended to have an intrinsic worth based on the weight of the coin. But we left the gold standard, and most economists worldwide agreed it was a really good idea to go away from the gold standard because you could not adjust the value of your currency to deal with problems in the marketplace. And so we moved to fiat money, where we just have dollars that are, in fact, not intrinsically worth anything, except they're backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government. That has, in practice, turned out to be considered quite valuable. But it's sort of a floating value, only based on how, whatever extent you trust the US government. And the same thing for the euro and all the other currencies out there. And virtual currencies have now do the same thing without any connection to a government. So Bitcoin is, again, backed by absolutely nothing and has no intrinsic value, but it is, um, considered valuable because people trust the mathematical protocol of the software running it, which determines how many new Bitcoins will be issued per year, that there won't be too many, and it can't be deflated or anything, and it's effectively e-gold is what they sell it for. It is basically hard currency like gold. There's only 21 million Bitcoins in the world that will ever be, 
and that's it. And they trade around sort of like uh, rare stamps. There's only so many of them, there's no way to make more uh, beyond the, the protocol, makes more for a while just to reward the early miners. And so that's turned out to have some value. It floats around, people regard it as having some value, even though it's not backed by any government or anything, but it also cannot be stopped by any government. Um, all right, so there's a bunch of these. Um, by the way, there have been other virtual currencies, of course. There are online things people pay for, like they pay for magic items in World of Warcraft. That's effectively money. There's some Linden dollars in Second Life. There's other in-game currencies that are effectively money and can be used for things like money laundering and are, but they're not cryptocurrencies. They're just a normal data recorded on a database server somewhere. Um, so Bitcoin has this cryptocurrency, which is the difference between this and something like the Linden dollar is the Linden dollar is like, uh, a visa. It's just a one computer somewhere keeping track of this, and if that computer was to go down and they lost the backups, or if the FBI was to raid them and, and take them down, it would just be gone. They would all be worthless, it would all be gone. But Bitcoin is a decentralized system with thousands of servers all over the world keeping track of it, and so unless you can take them all down, you can't stop it. You can outlaw it in one country and take down one node, but the other nodes keep running, and so if you own some Bitcoin, you have a reg you, nobody can steal it from you, and nobody can stop it from being recognized on a Bitcoin network until they shut down all the computers in the world. That's so in case you're thinking of surviving a war or a nuclear holocaust or something, then that's what kind of thing people think about to put their money in Bitcoin. Anyway, um, so this I thought was kind of funny. I read this all the time. This is not true. This is a really miserable way to describe it, that the miners are solving a difficult mathematical problem. That is not really true at all. All they're doing is putting a random number in the block and calculating the hash and hoping to get lucky. So the best description is what I read, um, David Gerard said, they're basically printing lottery tickets, trying to get a winning lottery ticket. That's the mathematical problem. They're just doing a calculation, then they get it one chance, then they do it again and again until they finally hit the one that wins, and then one of the miners gets a reward. But that's, that's what makes the system so secure, that you're printing an incredible amount of electricity and computing power to mine each block and make it signed so it can't be changed, and that means it would be very expensive to hack. You can't really forge any of the blocks because they're so difficult to make that it would be really expensive to make fake blocks that would pass the test. Anyway, it turns out to be quite successful, although it does consume a lot of electricity. It does have this property that you have, if you buy Bitcoin, you have something that nobody can take away from you, um, not unless they can find your secret key, which you do have to hide somewhere. So the peer-to-peer -peer services like Venmo are out there too. Um, and uh, then there's evidence all over the web. There's the Wayback Machine that archives old snapshots of a website, although they are not complete. They're basically just the front page. They don't have all the links, they don't have the files and everything, so they really are more a record of the style of old websites, not really thorough. And there's lots of people that keep statistics, historical statistics, which are quite useful, particularly DNS history is extremely useful. If you find a server doing something bad, if you can find out what previous domains have been on that website, it will probably be the previous activities of that criminal group because they use the same server over and over again for different campaigns. So it's quite useful to get old DNS records. And then there's a lot of ways to search about people. These are um, useful for private investigators and HR people and also for um, stalkers and various forms of unsavory people want to intrude on your privacy, but there's lots of ways to search, and this is what's increasingly coming out. In America, everybody is spying on you all the time on the internet, and they're gathering that data, and they're selling it to anybody who will pay for it. To an incredible extent, it's many, many revelations have been coming out over the last several years. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any legal recourse for this. The one that came out about a week ago that really bothered me is the online therapy services, where you can talk to a counselor, are keeping records of what your mental diseases are and what you said and selling it to advertisers then resell it all over the place. And this is perfectly legal in America and they don't even tell you, which apparently not, none of this is illegal in America. It's certainly illegal in Europe. In Europe, you cannot collect anybody's data without telling them what you're gonna do with it and you can't change your mind later and do something else with it or that's illegal. And it is not that way in America. Um, and although more sites are beginning to obey these rules because they want to do business in Europe. And Europe is way ahead of us on privacy regulation. The CCSF, well, I do not know if BetterHelp specifically does this. I don't think they're mentioned in the articles, but I sure think they do because they think they're the biggest. Um, but they say those medical records are just being sold and they're not covered by HIPAA. HIPAA is the American medical privacy law, but it does not apply to most medical services. It only applies to like medical insurance providers. So you can run a medical service, get medical data, and throw it around like junk, 
and you're not violating the American privacy laws, right? Now, European privacy laws are much better. Anyway, then of course there's social networking, which is extremely helpful if you want to find out what people are doing. And this is now routine. Whenever people apply for a job, they go to your social network and they won't hire you if they go to your social network and find you taking drugs, posing with guns, saying crazy things, you know. It's why they, they um, I know for years I've heard that if you go to law school, they will tell you, do not have any social networking at all. You cannot have any record of you doing anything, taking a vacation, taking pictures, going to a party, having any kind of opinions will come up later. They'll say you're, you are biased in a case. You should just have a, a cipher online is the safest thing to do. Um, what are the chances they will expand the privacy law to include things like that? Um, I'd say they are very low. In fact, the Supreme Court right now is hearing arguments about Section 230, which would change the laws for free speech online, and they have surprisingly, even uh, the QAnon Supreme Court Justice, Clarence, Clarence Thomas, has said he doesn't want to change Section 230. When they have the arguments about what would happen by lowering the freedom of speech laws online, they, they cannot, nobody can explain what would happen at all. It seems like it would affect innocent things as well as, it, nobody can figure out how to change it to make it any better. And they seem like they're just gonna not change it. Um, so I think these things are really thorny. I think the only thing America could do would be to imitate the European privacy laws, which have a bunch of really reasonable things. They say, for example, if you are below the age of 18, you can ask people to erase everything you put up when you were below that age, and they have to do that. So your childish mistakes won't crack you for the rest of your life. They also say you can ask anybody what data they have on you, and they have to show you all the data they have on you. And also, you can ask them to delete the data they have on you. They have to delete it. A bunch of things like that, which they've always said, this is too expensive, it's technically impossible. And yet, when Europe passed that law, they all figured out how to do it. So the European laws are quite good, and I hope the American laws imitate them. But I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. Yeah, DJ's got a good quote from the, uh, the Supreme Court justices. They all seem to have realized that they're not experts on the internet and they can't really understand what this law is doing. They don't really understand all the complexities and they're not going to do something like Donald Trump wanted to just take down Section 230 and a few people do. But just taking that down, nobody knows what that would do. Section 230 is what makes the internet different than newspapers. The newspaper is liable for everything they print. So they can't run like Twitter where anybody can just post anything. They would get sued for that. They have to vet it and make sure it's accurate, and not mean and not racist and stuff first. And the web does not have to do that. They're specially exempted by Section 230. If somebody else puts content on your site and you distribute it, you're not responsible for that. You can't get sued for it. And that's, um, that's made it possible to have all these social networks. If you took that down, you couldn't have social networks anymore. And uh, so the Republicans under Trump said, well, that's why they're censoring right-wing content, so we have to tell them never to censor anything. And but then uh, it turned out, turned out Section 230 would not have that effect. So people are arguing. But I don't think there's going to be any change in the uh, laws in that direction in America because uh, we can't agree what change to make. Anyway, there's instant messengers, of course, to reach people like crazy. Um, the main one here is that WhatsApp is the, I think, most popular instant messenger now. WhatsApp is end-to-end -end encrypted from Facebook, which it's actually very good. And that's why um, when I recently it came out that the Fox News hosts used text messages to say things they really didn't want the world to know. Like they were saying things on the news, like the election was stolen, and Donald Trump really won, and the voting machines were hacked, and behind the scenes they all knew that was a lie. And they were screaming and yelling, this is a total lie, this is gonna destroy us, but we have to say it because otherwise our stock price will go down and money is more important than anything. And they would say this in text messages, which were plain text and collected by court order and appeared in court and came out. And one of the statements is, why are these people too stupid to use WhatsApp? If they had used WhatsApp, or signal, it would all have been encrypted and they probably wouldn't have been able to get it to put it in court. But anyway, um, yes, because they're just stupid. You know, they don't, they don't think about these things. Anyway, um, all right, and then of course, all the social media is enormous out there to find out what people are doing and who they're connected to. Um, all right, and you can search through a lot of online things. Um, they can search for metadata and documents to locate similar ones on the web. This happens all the time. A lot of criminal groups are brought down because they used like a username of like Frog7 and they found somebody else used the name Frog7 on a different forum or they had an old domain name that connected to something. It turns, it's really very hard to not leave tra tracks on the internet that will lead back to you. It can be done and the jester is the one hacktivist I know that for 10 years has been doing illegal things online and never gotten caught. And he claims to be an ex-military person who learned in the military how to really do this right. You have to have a 
different setup. You have to never make a mistake and do normal work on this machine. You have to always hide everything behind a VPN. And you know, if you have to be the same as a discipline, like a military person, to really do that. And only he's the only one I know that has actually had a long career of doing illegal things online and never gotten caught. Anyway, um, all right, you can find router information too. That's sometimes useful, increasingly putting, putting malware in routers. Uh, so there's a lot of law enforcement, uh, a lot of different law enforcement agencies and groups that uh, cooperate now. And when I went to a Secret Service meeting a few years ago uh, with the High Tech Crime Investigators Association, they said they're get, actually getting a lot of help from foreign agencies, even in Russia and stuff, to help catch criminals over there. Although I bet they're not getting much cooperation out of Russia anymore. This was before the Ukraine invasion. Anyway, so there's lots of online crime. A huge one is identity theft. Uh, the number one, one affecting people, uh, as opposed to companies, is romance scams. That's huge almost every time. Almost everybody seems to have had this happen or know somebody this happened to where they, they trick you into thinking they're going to marry you and be in love and they somehow manage to get your money. Uh, the most popular one right now is called pig butchering. They uh, approach you for romance and then say they've got an investment opportunity in cryptocurrency and then they convince you to put your money in there and they uh, gradually siphon it out over the course of like a year. It's extremely effective and really ruins people's lives. Uh, stolen credit cards are huge, of course. Um, stolen bank accounts, logins are also good. Electronic medical records are being sold like crazy. Um, and uh, counterfeit, I'm not quite sure what this is, counterproliferation, trying to stop weapons, traveling. Cyberbullying is huge. Um, people harassing people online just to ruin their lives. Uh, this happens a lot. And of course, all the nasty things that happen on social media, um, which we hear about all the time these days, especially now that uh, Elon Musk has brought it all back to Twitter. They've been trying to clean up Twitter and he's reversed it, trying to make Twitter toxic again, and apparently done a very good job. I don't know, he scared the whole security community away a few months ago and I left with them, so I don't really know what's going on on there, but I haven't heard anything good. Um, anyway, so you can capture online communications a lot of ways. If you can get screen captures, that's handy. You can do video evidence. You can view cookies, the registry and browsers, which we've talked about and we'll talk a lot more about in the future. All the evidence stored on all these computers is out there, so you know whatever you're doing online is very hard to conceal, very hard to lie about. All right, so that's it for the description of this. Let's try a Kahoot. I've got one here, Mod 5. All right. Uh, Jay, you don't particularly have evidence to the Kahoot on Kahoot, but you will see them in the lecture. They're in the lecture video, so you can go look at them there if you want to. I don't think they're that great, but anyway, you can, at the end of each lecture, you can see them. Well, I think I forgot to do the Kahoot a couple times in this class, I'm not sure. I think I remembered this semester in this class. They're pretty much the same kind of stuff you'll see in the quizzes. Hacker Kitty. That's good. All right, 
So which technique will catch a criminal in the act? That's the sting operation. One thing I've heard, seen a lot of news stories about, including ones around here, is a lot of the uh, terrorist plots that the Department of Homeland Security stopped are in fact ones they created by calling somebody and saying, why don't we blow something up? I can get the bombs, I can choose the target. They sort of talk somebody into doing it and then they, they can stop it. And so there's uh, some people are not too compressed by that. But anyway, those are sting operations. Is it possible that? Yes, apparently. There is a defense called entrapment that you think might protect them, but apparently it hasn't. Well, they try to get somebody to pee. Yeah. So what's with the dot onion address? Tor onions, Tor addresses ended dot onion. You know, according to the um, server malware analysis in the uh, Splunk training materials, the dot onion, there are other addresses besides dot onion that are also behind Tor, which is interesting to me. I wasn't aware there was another one. There's not, I saw another one ending in dot win or something that was also apparently an onion address. So this may have expanded beyond the onions now behind Tor. But most of the ones I've seen in Tor end in dot onion. All right, so which dark website distributed child porn? Yep, that was Playpen. All right, and what's a public record of cryptocurrency transactions? Yep, that's the blockchain. All right. Again, looks like a real name. That's a real name. Okay. All right, good. All right, we stop this recording.